color. <laughs> ah. How do I? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, okay, two seconds, two seconds. Hi. It's been a long time since I've gone live because I got banned from my main account. So it's a little awkward. Anyway, my family's been going through a lot. So I've, not all the time, I'm exhausted a lot because I have a bunch of kids. But because of all the stress going on in the family, sleeping's hard sometimes. You know, and when you're a mom and you're like 24-7, like just staying up and it's quiet, nobody's yelling at you, you're tired the next morning, but like, just the silence, oh, you know, the silence is just so beautiful. <laughs> anyway. They banned me from my main account just for being a mom. Be, just for being a mom. Really upset about it, but there's nothing I can do about it. Permanently banned forever. So I thought I'd try to go live here. I know there's. I mean, I've got like three posts over here. It was just set up to go live, but I haven't had time to go live. Um, because n none of you personally know me, um, my father is really, really sick and swore me to secrecy, meaning that I'm not allowed to tell anybody other than my husband. Like me and my sister know, my, my brother knows, my mom passed away not too long ago, but like he doesn't want us to tell anyone and it's excruciating watching him die slowly and um, not being able to talk about it or like reach out to people for support and prayers and you know it, I'm respecting his wishes but man it's hard because my mom was here one minute and gone the next because she was admitted into the hospital during the lockdown and uh, she was admitted just because her doctor said well maybe you should take her to the hospital and get her checked she was fine though and then they admitted her and wouldn't let anybody come in and she went in healthy and fine and then she was like getting sicker and sicker and nobody was allowed in and then we got all these crazy phone calls. It's an emergency. You have to come in right away. She has permanent brain damage. And we're like, how'd that happen? And they're like, well, we accidentally overdosed her. I mean, he admitted it. I recorded it. I re he didn't say we accidentally. He said we overdosed her. So, it is what it is. That's my husband when he's gone. Asher. Because <laughs> my husband comes out and be like, what are you doing awake? Yeah. 
I'm scared of the dark. You're scared of the dark. Come here. Look at this cutie. He had one bad dream. And now he's afraid of the dark. And he has a bedroom with his two, one big brother and one little brother. There's nothing to be scared of. Daddy's right beside you. I just tucked you in like 15 times. I want to go and sit downstairs. Asher, I'm doing something right now. Listen, turn off your tablet and close your eyes and you will go to sleep. That's what Daddy has you do. I'll be up to check on you in a minute, okay? You're fine. You have your snack. You have your drink. You have your teddy. One night, he, he used to be great. He would go up to his bedroom because you know, he gets tired early with school. And he would go up there early, get in his bed, watch his tablet, fall asleep all by himself. And then he had one scary dream that he saw a monster in his closet under his bed or both and ever since then he's been afraid of the dark and every time he hears a noise he thinks there's somebody in his room and it's just stinks because he was asleep and now he's awake so something's going on anyway this is probably going to be a boring live because I have absolutely nothing like thought out um You know, when the CVID hit, um, and my mom was admitted and then dead so fast, we didn't have any time to say goodbye to her. It was so traumatic because she was locked up for a month and then gone, and nobody was allowed in. I mean, that's torture. It wasn't just her. All these people were locked up and... Oh, it just... It's... So heartbreaking. And not only was she kept from her family to suffer and die alone and go through God only knows what, but they... The doctor literally said, because she's always had high cholesterol, or high... Oh, sorry high sodium and uh, that's always been a thing she's had now if he would have just made a phone call and said you know her sodium side and say yeah that's who she is she's always had high sodium well instead of making the phone call and I'm the person they were supposed to call and they didn't um, they couldn't get her sodium to come down and they weren't patient they wanted it immediate so they just kept injecting her with more and more higher, higher doses, and which is what ended up giving her permanent brain damage. And when they brought us in to tell us that her life was over and she was going to be dead within a week, um, he said, they taught us in medical school that, um, you know, when you um, give this medication, um, if your sodium goes too high, brain fry. Too high, brain fry. Too high, brain fry. So, I was like, so you knew? You were taught not to do, to, to do this. Yet, you did it. And he was like, yes. He, absolutely no compassion. No... Just... Uh, no remorse. No... Just, yep, that's what I did. Um, and I'm like, and you didn't call us? Because if you would have, we would have told you, don't bother. You know, that's, it's just like having anemia or something, you know? Like, it's just, that's part of who I am. Like, it's just unbelievable. So, you know, when my grandparents were sick when I was a kid, the entire family, my mom and all of her siblings, there was like seven of them, and they're husbands and wives and kids and then the other side of the family like, there were so many people and none of the doctors got to make one decision without 
a meeting with the whole family. You know what I mean? The whole family would meet with the doctor, and the doctor could not move forward with any medical procedure without the permission of the family, you know? And they just did whatever they wanted with my mom and all the other patients that were locked up there. I went up there so many times, and it was absolutely heartbreaking watching people, like, held back by security, yelling, screaming, crying, knowing that their husband, their wife, their mom, their dad, their grandma was going to die alone, and they weren't even going to get to say goodbye. Like, it was just unbelievable. I've never experienced anything so cruel, heartless, just horrifying it was so traumatic um, because of a virus which none of us had she didn't have you know like why couldn't we see her what they did to those people And they told us she was brain dead. And once they said she was destined to death, they said that we could go in and see her. Only after they declared her brain dead and gave her a week to live, they let us in. And um, yet she knew who I was. She begged me to take her home. Um, she didn't want to be there. She asked about her grandchildren. And I'm like, wait a minute, she's brain dead, right? Like, how does she know who I am? And so I finally freaked out, got one of the doctors in there, or the doctor, the doctor, and he's like, well, I mean, yeah, she's brain dead, but, you know, like, throughout, she, he gave her, like, five to seven days to live, right? And he's like, she's brain dead, but, like, it's going to get worse every day. Well... To her very last day, she still knew who I was. So, none of it made sense. And what ended up killing her was they refused to, um, they said she was brain dead. And they refused to give her a feeding tube or um, fluids. So she ended up starving and thirsting to death. That's, that was her cause of death, not brain damage. They refused to give her fluids or um, a feeding tube. Why? Like, we were fighting to save her life, and they just refused. I mean, lawsuit? Yeah, sure. But, you know, you call and you talk to these lawyers, and they're like, get in line with the other 10 million people. You know what I mean? And it just makes it feel so hopeless. I hope nobody else went through any of that. It was absolutely horrifying. I'm still traumatized. I lost my firstborn son in an absolutely traumatic way. And then my mother. Unbelievable. Did any of you experience... People locked up, dying, you know, when the hospitals were locked down, not being able to see them or make any medical decisions or, and now my poor dad's dying. It's just awful. My mom was only 68, in perfect health when she walked into the hospital. Like, she went for a regular checkup. I begged my dad. I was like, Dad, I called mom and dad. I was like, Dad, until all this stuff blows over, I don't care what's going on. <laughs> don't go to the hospital unless it's, like, life or death. Like, don't do it. Well, Dad had made a regular checkup for Mom without telling me. And the doctor was like, well, it's not, you know, necessary, but you could take her to get checked. 
um, because of this, just little things that, that could be checked. And mom was terrified. She gets in the car and she's like, where are you taking me? He's like out to lunch and he took her to the hospital and, um, and then they wouldn't let her out and wouldn't let any of us in. And I was like, dad, I told you, like, I think he thought I was crazy, but I knew what was coming, um, by the grace of God. And he didn't listen to me. Um, my mom would still be here today. There was nothing wrong with her. It's awful. And what still gets me to this day is that they said she was brain dead. And then they refused to feed her or give her fluids. So she starved to death and thirsts to death. And yet the whole time responded to us. Knew our names. Knew who we were. Knew her grandchildren. Knew her husband. You know, kept saying she wanted to go home. Like... No, to the day she died, no signs of brain damage, none. The only sign she showed was, you know, starvation and, you know, what complete dehydration. You know, what happens when you literally thirst and starve to death. And the fact that that's how my mother died and that's how the hospital, they didn't give us options. They're like, listen. This is what they said to us. You can see your mother and all she wanted to do was see us. You can see your mother and um, she's going to die within a week or she'll be locked in here indefinitely and you'll never see her again. And in our minds, we're like, well, what else are they going to do to her? We were so worried about her condition, you know, like, Looking at pictures of her before she went in to when we went in there, it was unbelievable. Um, so mom made the choice, brain dead, that she wanted to see her family. And, um, and, and that's not a choice. It's, you should be able to choose, I, I want to see my family and I should still have the right to live. I want to see my family and I should still have the right to um, proper nutrition and fluids. Like, what kind? Okay, you choose to die or you're going to be kept from your family. Like, she was so desperate at that point because it had been two months. And I guess in her mind, it's like, well, you know, I'd, I'd rather see them and die than be stuck here and tortured. And we would have never got to see her. And that was a threat. That is coercion. That is absolutely illegal to say, hey, you know, we're going to hold your mother and never let you see her again unless you choose to let her. Well, they gave her the choice. She's the one that made the choice. But that should have never been an option. She should have been, she should have been able to choose to have a feeding tube and fluids and, you know, the, the right to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and her health and, you know, to strive to live and see her family. Nobody should do, be denied their family when they're, you know, in a, in a, position like that and when somebody is completely vulnerable and alone and cannot stand up for themselves they need somebody to be there to stand up like that's why we have power of attorneys and you know people who make decisions for our, us when we can't make decisions for ourselves medically you know because and and then when they take that away I was that for her and they wouldn't let me in the hospital I was the person that was, me and my sister, 
but I was listed first. My sister was listed, listed second. They made every single decision without calling either of us, one, and they didn't let us in the hospital. So we have no idea what happened. You know, I mean, I could just, I don't know. It's so awful getting on TikTok anymore. It's like every day there's new murders, new missing people, new stillbursts. It's just like, you know, new natural disasters. It's just one thing after another thing after another thing. It's just, and with social media, I know it's more in your face than it used to be, but man... We've had social media for a while, and it's never been this intense, unless they're just trying really, really, really hard to, you know, make sure that we're always in a state of fear. I don't let it get to me, but it seems like that's what's going on recently. I mean, because it's just nonstop. One thing, you can't even keep track of it anymore. <laughs> you hear one thing, and by the time you're like, Oh my gosh, what's going on with that? Another thing pops up. It's insane. In order to keep my sanity, I just have to concentrate on my family. There's enough going on here, you know? But anyway, when we first moved into this home, before my mom got, before the CVID hit, and um, everything that happened with mom... Um, I used to be like, you know, my ex was terrible and extremely abusive and it was awful. It was terrible. Um, I had to live in hiding for six years. It was just unbelievable what I went through with him. And, um, finally got away and married an amazing man and, uh, but I uh, blamed, I had a lot of hatred towards God because, you know, the man that I gave my life to hurt me and beat me and abused me and my ba my first baby died and I figured God hate hated me, you know. So, you know, I was completely, like, if you said you'd pray for me, I'd laugh in your face and, um... It's an absolute miracle because I was so anti-God. Um, but yeah, I got saved. It's an absolute miracle. So when we moved into this home, I wanted to start prayer groups. And uh, one thing after another thing after another thing happened. And it just never happened. I wanted to have prayer groups at my home. And I still think that I should be doing that. I know that it's not just me that needs it. Other people need it. Everybody's going through a lot. And then sometimes I think, well, I'm so busy with all my kids. The least I can do is get online and pray for people. But even that's hard. It's like right now I'm exhausted. I should be in bed. But if any of you want prayers or need prayers, just let me know. I have a YouTube that I haven't posted on for a while, but I did share my testimony, and I shared this incredible vision that the Lord gave me that really, really um, helped me out a lot when I was, like, going through the, you know, like, I knew Christ, you know, I was being... Why am I drawing a blank? It's you're being, it's your deliverance slash chastisement. You know, you're growing. You're a baby and you're figuring everything out. And that's where I was at a child, a baby. Um, and uh, I was really scared there for a while. And, um, he gave me this incredible vision 
and I uh, shared it on YouTube. Because it gave me so much peace. It was so powerful. Anyway. Who's the missing girl? I've seen so many missing girls today on my, my For You page. Or missing people. I'll just have to check out your page. Let me click. I followed you so I can figure it out. So I don't know if you're still on here. Anyway, guys, this is probably boring. I'm hungry. <laughs> uh, I used to do lives all the time. I got out of the practice. So for a long time, I was a beauty influencer on Instagram. <laughs> and like, I don't know. 2014, 15, 16, 17, something like that. I worked with a lot of really big brands. I got up to like 60 or 70K. Like, I thought I, you know, I, I made it bigger than I ever thought I would. But I didn't have the time to. Once you collaborate with all these big brands, I mean, it is nonstop work. It is a lot of time and hours. And, you know, I have all these kids, and I had worked so hard because I'm an artist. So I was like, this is a way I can work from home. And I never thought I'd be able to make it, and I did. And then I had to quit because. I didn't, I could not do what was needed of me from the brands, from the followers. <sighs> so much time. So much time. It's like more than a full-time job, you know, in the beginning until I guess you get big enough that maybe you can afford some help or something, but... But yeah, that was a bit heartbreaking. <laughs> I made it and I quit. So um, I think I'm down to like 20 or 30K on Insta. I, I literally quit and just never got back on because it was too depressing. I just, you know, my followers just disappeared. And Instagram is so cruel. I got on there one day and like I used to have like thousands and thousands of likes on all my posts and stuff. And... Now, I don't know if it's still like this because I was so traumatized. I got on there one day and there was zero, everything, zero comments, zero likes. And then like six months later I got back on and it was like 100 likes, two comments. And I'm like, are they punishing me for like not getting on their app or like, you know, because I have screenshots of what really happened. It's frustrating, you know. Anyway, so. A movie reviewer, that's cool. Yeah, I've always been an artist, but. <sighs> I'm a mom of seven, so I have six children living and one that's with the Lord. Um, my oldest is 20, but I've got a 13 year old, an 11 year old, an 8 year old, a 6 year old, and a 1 year old. 
I was like, like it. What do I find beautiful now? In the midst of all the chaos, especially in such a huge family, with so much um, heartbreak around us, um, your question, I find beautiful, to maintain joy and happiness and hope in the darkest of times where it feels completely, where you feel so helpless when you are able to find the beauty, the hope, and the faith that things will get better, that you are strong enough to get through this. It's really hard because every day can be so overwhelming that you just don't even know how you're going to get through it this day so to me you know it's just one day at a time and being able to find hope when there's when we're told there's no hope finding hope having faith regardless of the circumstances and um Quieting the noise and allowing yourself to, you know, still be strong and happy and find joy in every day, regardless to how hard it is. And it is hard. Every day is hard. So, what does getting better look like? Getting better... Um, In, like getting better how getting better from like when I lost my son what does that look like I mean, what do you mean exactly like when my son died there's approximately like the PTSD was so bad for six months of my life I remember every single thing that happened in the hospital Every single thing. I remember the funeral. And then there's six months of my life. No memory. None. My poor sister, she has a PhD. She's a professor. And uh, she had to take six months off to come and take care of me. Because. Gone. Gone. Um. So, they say time heals all wounds. No. In time, life brings new things into your life. New people, new children, new reasons to give you a purpose to live. So, you know, you're not only focusing on the heartache, you know... And then in time, you're still broken, but you get to a point where you're thankful. Like, if I could go back, are there things that I would change? Yes, because he would be here today. But, um, I would never, ever, even though... Regardless to how much it put me through, I would never take away that experience. I would never not, you know, go back in time and decide, well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to experience this because I love my son and going through what I went through made me who I am today, you know, It's so hard. 
it's easy to say, like, I understand what you're going through, or, but, like, until you go through something so absolutely heartbreaking, like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, you walk into the market, I'll never forget things like this happening after the six months was up, and I was starting to, like, realize I was alive. I walk into the market, and I'd see all these people just, like, doing things. Like, walking up and down the aisles. Shopping with lists and, like, lives. And I'm like... And I felt like all these people were in one world. And I was in another world. That nobody else could understand. You know? And this world was so secluded and so painful. And... I so desperately just wanted to jump back into this world where all these people were happy and clueless of this absolutely devastating pain that rips everything that you've ever known from you and makes you like not even be able to relate to anyone. Which in time gives you wisdom. It makes you so much more um, compassionate towards other people because, you know, without these life experiences, we could, you know, I will never judge anyone. I used to be a hypocrite. You know, I, I was the perfect mom and the perfect this and the perfect that and, you know, everything always had to be perfect. I was wrong. I was a hypocrite, you know. Um, you know, so it it taught me a lot. It humbled me and um I'm thankful for it. Um I'm thankful. I'm thankful for Colin. I'm thankful for the nine months I had with him. Because he's still with me. He will forever be with me. And he has made me the wife I am today. The friend I am today. The daughter. The sister. The mother I am today. You know, because... You know, I was just oblivious before. I am now so much more... um, considerate, careful, you know, with the way I talk to people, treat people, because you never know what somebody's going through. So, yeah, it's taught me a lot. So, I mean, I think getting better looks like knowing how to live in the unknown and like I heard a guy say it the other day and I couldn't put it better so like you know a lot of people will say when somebody dies maybe we should live every day like it's our last but it's the opposite when you experience something extremely traumatic like losing a child every day is your first it's like You wake up and you're like, why am I brushing my teeth? Like, you're so disoriented. Why do we even shower? What People are at the market? How can they do that? This doesn't make any sense. Like, how can people, like, run errands? What? Why? Why do we do that? Like, everything's a first. So it's not like, you know, living every day like it's your last. Live every day like it's your first. And it's really hard if you haven't been in that position. But, you know, it takes the simplest things, like taking a shower. And you're like, why am I bothering? Why, why am I doing this? Why do we even shower? Because those things, those everyday tasks that we just do without thinking about... Once you've lived through something so heartbreaking that just, like, takes your soul and crushes it into a million pieces, 
none of those things make sense. They don't matter anymore. Like, why? What's the point? So you have to work really hard to realize, okay, well, I have to take a shower, you know, because that's what we do. And I might not, you know, think it's important, but I got to do it. And, um, you know, I do it because I love my family. You know, I have to find outside reasons why I do these things because at the time, you know, it, I couldn't do it for myself. Yeah, I mean, we all go through really difficult times. Like, I'm sure, no, when I went through my six months of just being gone, my sister was my caretaker. God, it's awful, but I'm so thankful she did that. My poor sister, she's my baby sister, she watched me deliver my dead baby. She quit work and, and school. And they were kind enough to let her take all this time off to take care of me. And I can't even imagine. Like, she's my baby sister. It would kill me. Um, to take care of me. I was like a little baby again. Curled up in a ball. Because I was sent home, not with a baby, with a box. A cold box with pictures. I would just cry and scream and cry and scream all day, every day. Um, when my sister finally went home, she started experiencing night terrors. And she didn't tell me this for a while. I think she didn't want to upset me anymore. But she experienced night terrors for years. So, I mean, it affected, it affected our whole family. My parents were broken. Like, and it hurts me to know that, you know, the death of my son absolutely destroyed my family. Like, they survived, but never the same. You know, there is no going back. Like, I have a daughter. I could not imagine watching her go through that. But, um... Your dad, you have to forgive him. And I know it's hard. Like, I forgave my ex who beat me, abused me in every way that you can imagine. Because we all are imperfect and make terrible mistakes and do things that we look back on and just wish that we could take it back and we can't. And I'm not making excuses for your dad at all. But for your own well-being, you have to forgive him so that you can heal and be the best version of yourself. You have to just forgive him so that you can truly love yourself and heal fully. I mean, it's the only way to do it. I literally, <clears throat> after the Lord intervened in my life, which was, I didn't see that one coming. Um, a few months later, I started praying for my ex-husband. Every time I took a shower, I couldn't believe it. After everything he had done to me, oh my God. That man, I mean, I lived in hiding for six years. He, you know, he wanted to, um, but I prayed, you know, I forgave him. I asked for forgiveness for any wrongdoings I may have done to him. And I forgave him for everything that he did for me. And I asked the Lord to you know, help remove any of that anger or hatred or, um, you know, the things that were out of my control. I asked the Lord to help me fully forgive. And I mean, 
I was tormented with um, my PTSD from losing my son and my PTSD from my ex was just as bad. Um, I was afraid to leave my house. I, I mean, I was afraid to go anywhere because I was afraid he was going to find me. He was following me. He's, I mean, it was awful. Um, I prayed for full deliverance and forgiveness. But first, I had to forgive him. And I had to forgive myself. And I had to ask the Lord for forgiveness for everything that I did wrong to him. Because, I mean, I didn't do what, I did nowhere near what he did to me. Like, you know, you know, I didn't abuse him. But, you know, I'm not perfect. You know, I made mistakes in the marriage too. So I needed forgiveness. I forgave him. And I asked the Lord to come in and do what I couldn't. And, oh my gosh, this huge weight lifted. And, um, because the trauma from my, my ex carried over into my new marriage and my husband is absolutely amazing. He is the sweetest man. Like he, he's amazing. He's absolutely a godsend. Like it's like God, God sent an angel down to take care of me. Um, and I had all these traumas from my past that I would put onto him and he didn't deserve that. So I needed deliverance from that so that I could start new. And you need deliverance from that so that you can start new. You know, and you just have to understand that I mean, I don't know if you have faith or if you believe in God. But if you do, sin is sin, you know, and if we weren't sinful and, okay, so this is a different, like, I, I'm, I consider myself saved by Christ, but I'm still a sinner, saved by grace. I can try my best, but I, I will always be a sinner, saved by grace. But people who don't have the knowledge of Christ and at least try to forgive and and to mend their wrongs and to reach out to people and say, like, this was wrong, can you please forgive me? Um, wait, where was it going with this? Um, you have to understand that, like, if... if your father was in the body of Christ and and had the knowledge of Christ and a heart for Christ and a love for Christ. It's a you know, it's it's a gift. God gives us the Holy Spirit, an ability to love and forgive people that we could never do before. I mean, there's no way I could have ever forgiven my ex, not to mention pray for him. Um, so we asked God to intervene and we can separate the person, my ex, your father, from the sins they've committed. And you can hate the sin, but don't hate the person, you know, because, I mean, that's why Jesus came to die for us, so that we could be saved and forgiven from our sin. And we are all sinners. We're all guilty. So, you know, if you can separate the sin from the man, because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So, you know, we're all damaged. We're all broken. We all make mistakes. And we can't hold others to higher standards than we hold ourselves, because we make mistakes too. And I know people do terrible things, trust me. My ex did horrendous things, but I've fully forgiven him and I pray that he repents and comes to Christ, you know? So, forgiveness. I think that's the answer, forgiveness. And if you could ask the Lord to help you, you know, have the strength and the wisdom and the um to give you a new heart and a new mind 
so that you're able to do these things. Because, man, if these guys would have met me like five years ago, if somebody would have like commented, I'll pray, I'll pray for you, I'd be like, yeah, right. Like, that's going to do anything. And then, you know, God showed up and changed my entire life. I mean, I was a single mom in hiding, living on social services and HUD and like barely getting by, not knowing how I was going to feed my kids. It was horrifying. And then this amazing man of God showed, shows up and swoops me off my feet and... God entered my heart and told me that, you know, you're going to marry this man. You're going to trust me. And as long as you trust me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he has kept every promise he has ever made me. You know, in his word, he says that he is close to the brokenhearted. You know, and I think back to all those times where I was cursing him. He was always right there. He was always with me. So, he's close to you too. Just call out on his name, I promise. Like... I guess you can try to imagine what it would be like to have, you know, a re like, to get to know and understand God. And I guess I had somewhat of a idea in my head of what it would be like. It's the exact opposite. Like, it's absolutely unbelievable. Like, He never ceases to amaze me. What do I find? I find every day beautiful. I think that every single day is a gift and a blessing. My children, my family, my husband, every day that we wake up with breath in our lungs, you know? Hi, I'm in Maryland. But faith has changed my life. I had, um, after, a <coughs> after I lost my son, I fell down a flight of like 20 steps in the pouring down rain. Concrete steps painted. You're not allowed to do that. <coughs> I was at the top of the steps. Flew up. Feet up. Fell down on my back. All the way down the concrete steps. Pouring down rain. I'm all by myself. I had driven there and dropped off somebody. My best friend. Who was in the house. I'm outside screaming at the top of my lungs. She can't hear me. People just walked by me. And I knew, like, I, am I paralyzed? I, I couldn't move. I never felt pain like that in my entire life. I had to crawl to my car. I managed to drive home. I have no idea how. And then I was taken to the emergency room and treated like a drug seeker. They said there was nothing wrong with me and sent me home. And, and it was uh, the night... I spent all the night before Easter, so I got home, and it was time for Easter, and I was still in excruciating pain. So, first thing, my doctor's office opened up. I went in there, and he sent me up for um, an MRI, and they were like, yeah, you've got like four or five, I can't remember, it's been so long, herniated discs in your back. It's really, really bad. Um, it was really, really, really bad. I can't remember all the medical... <laughs> terminology but 
I was in a wheelchair for over a year. I could not walk. I was in pain management. It was absolutely horrifying. I gained 250 pounds. I couldn't walk. I had just lost a baby. And for six months, I was mentally gone. And then I finally start you know, driving and picking up a friend and I fall down a flight of steps and break my back. And I was only 23 years old. And now I can't walk, I'm in, I'm in a wheelchair. I gain 200 and some pounds, next thing you know, I'm 350 pounds and I can't walk. I mean, unbelievable. And this went on for ever. I was in pain management. They had me on all these crazy drugs. They were shooting stuff up in my spine that made the pain, pain worse. I just kept gaining more weight. Um, anyway, it was awful. The amount of pain I lived with, There's people can only handle so much pain. I was in so much pain by the time I had Malachi. I like, there's no way I could live as a mom. I couldn't live with that much pain. I could not survive with that much pain. I, it was my pain. Like I couldn't sit. I couldn't lay. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't move. I, I mean, I was my pain level was on a scale from one to a million. I was at a million and, and trillion. Like it was unbelievable pain. And this went on forever. And I'm crying to my precious little like two year old at the time, and he's like, "Mommy, how does your back get fixed?" And I was like. There isn't any way to fix my back. The doctor even said that if he does surgery, well, I'm, I'm so young, he's nervous to do surgery, and he says that over 50% of the people that got the surgery are in here in just as much pain, if not more. So, um, because he has a daughter my age who was nice enough to be honest with me and tell me not to get the surgery, praise the Lord. Um, so my son Malachi is like so there's nothing we can do and I was like this is before I knew the Lord okay and I was like well I mean I guess the only way I could it could stop is if God decided to heal me and he was like yeah 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 let's do that uh, I want everyday mommy let's pray but you have to remind me how and I was like okay so, um, that night, it's like, Dear Heavenly Father, can you please, my mommy's in a lot of pain. I want her to be happy. I don't want her to cry. I want her to play with me. Can you please heal her? Something real simple like that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The next day, I'm driving the kids to school. I'm in so much pain, I could hardly get in the van. I'm in such excruciating pain while driving. I'll never forget this. I'm driving and I glance in the rear view mirror. I can hardly move. And I see Malachi's little face. And he's like, Mommy, can you remind me of the prayer? And I was like, Sure. There's so much pain. Dear Heavenly Father, can you please heal Mommy's back? Because, you know, she can't take care of me, she can't play with me. And I want her to be happy and healthy. Please. Please heal my mommy. And I could just see the, like the absolute... I was watching him through the rear view mirror. And it was just... The most beautiful... Like he was so... His prayer was so desperate and sincere. Like... Because he was so scared for his mommy. And uh, anyway. So I drop him off at... Uh, he must not have been too because he was in preschool. Drop him off at preschool. It's only a half a day. And uh, I pick him up at the bus. And first thing he gets off the bus, he runs up to me. He's like, Mommy, how's your back feel? I was like, my back? <laughs> like, I started to move I like in ways I could never move. And I was like, oh my gosh. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's never come back.
that was when he was two. He's nine now. I mean, I'm so thankful because you know how the, the Lord's word says how, you know, um, we must come to him, you know, like a child because their hearts are so innocent and pure and Anyway, it was so beautiful. And he healed my, he healed me. It's, I mean, I've been to the doctor many times since and I'm cured. Like, I don't have to go to pain management. I don't have to have shots in my spine. I can walk. I can move. You tell me. It was, it was an absolute miracle because my little boy was so scared for me. I mean... And then I was like, wow. Maybe God likes me. <laughs> like for the first time in my life, you know. Because <laughs> I thought he hated me because, you know, my son was dead and my husband, my ex-husband was terrible. And But no, God is good. Do I ever feel like nobody understands me? Um... Yeah, I definitely um, used to be, um, you know, the worldly, you know, fit in with everybody type of person. Um, and then the Lord came into my life <laughs> and uh, I have a handful of people that get me because they've experienced the same things. Um, but like my sister, you know, um, I pray for her every day that one day, you know, she'll experience these things. But, um, you know, I'm like, Ember, you know me. Like, I went from one extreme to another. That doesn't happen, you know. And repentance, what repentance means is a change of mind. It's, it's like you, you, you go from being one person to a different person, you know. And I'm... A person that I never, ever could have seen myself. I was independent. I was, you know, like, proud. I wanted to do things on my own. I wanted to prove myself to the world. I wanted, you know, all these, like... And now, you know, just want to, you know, take care of my family. Um, love my husband. Serve the Lord. change of mind and change of heart yes I mean one of the same kinda cause I mean it's a change of mind and heart it all kinda happens simultaneously you know like not by choice it just happens it's like oh you know and it's crazy because people will say you're you know you're brainwashed. And it's like, no, I was set free. <laughs> like, I have nothing to fear. Because I know that my God is right here with me. And all I have to do is ask. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. Ever. All I have to do is ask of him. I say, this is how I pray. And I've prayed for years and gotten closer and closer to him. And this is how he has led me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, according to your will, according to your word, and according to your grace, may this, you know what I mean? So, may whatever be done. And according to his will, which is perfect. His grace, which is perfect. And his word, which is perfect. You know, so it's really hard to... Um, get a no when you ask him according to all those things because all you have to do is have the faith of a mustard seed. You have to believe that, you know, his word is true. And it is. I mean, I could go on and 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 on about the things he has done for me. And I feel so unworthy. I am a 
dirty, rotten sinner saved by grace. <laughs> my husband, like, when the Lord came into my heart for like a whole year, I was just in shock. Jesus loves me? I couldn't believe he loved me. Like, I just couldn't believe it. I was in absolute shock. Not only that he loved me, but that he was here to help me and, like, heal me and talk to me and, you know, like, he wasn't some faraway man in the sky. Like, you know, he's right here with me. He's in my heart, you know. He's the word made flesh. Amen to that. absolutely amazing and it's crazy because my husband was homeschooled and raised as a Christian and I mean I I knew when I was a kid I believed in God and um, then thing, terrible things happened my V as a teenager well, not a teen a young teen my virgin was taken by the RA word. So that was terrible. And then, you know, the whole marrying an abuser and losing my first son. All these terrible things happened. So I was like, how could a good God, like, that's how I lost my faith. Um, my husband was raised, he believed in God as a child. He was raised in a Christian home. He was homeschooled. He went to church all the time. Um, he knew God was real, just like I did. I always knew God was real. Even when I was like, I'm going to party in hell. You know, because screw God. Like, you know, I was literally saying those things. Um, but I still knew he was real. Um, so, uh, you know, my husband always knew God was real, but he had never had salvation. I got saved. And then I started, like, all I could talk, I, I, I was in shock that Jesus loved me and saved me. I couldn't believe it. And it's all I could talk about. And my husband, well, we weren't married yet, but he was like, can you please just like, it's too much. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much. I mean, he was still a godly man, but he wasn't saved. Um, and so I started praying. Well, the Lord t put it on my heart. You need to hold his hand every day and pray together. So we started doing that. Every day we would join hands and pray. And um, first time was extremely awkward. <laughs> Not anymore. But anyway, within uh, less than a month, all he could talk about was God. <laughs> it was amazing. The Lord saved him. And then a week later, we were married. So it was it was just amazing. And it's just so incredible to have a marriage in Christ. You know what I mean? Like a marriage where like I can't imagine being married to somebody Who I couldn't share my love for the Lord with, you know. Who I couldn't have all these deep conversations with about my faith. Because, and not only that, you know, uh, you know, the Lord teaches us that, you know, the Father is supposed to, well, we as a family, but you know, we have to leave, uh, raise our children upright, you know, and um, my husband has a very, very um, big role in, uh, in bringing the children upright to the Lord and, you know, putting them in the right direction. So do I, but I mean, um, I do believe that, you know, I don't, trust me, I'm still stubborn and hard-headed but I do, I have humbled myself. It's been really hard because 
I'm a very strong-willed woman. Um, but I do let him be the man of the house most of the time. <laughs> I try. Anyway. Yes, that is amazing. So, is your wife um, a part of the body of Christ? Praise the Lord. And so are you? I have a TikTok that says, what does it say? Praying couples. Praise the Lord. Um, what does it say? Uh, couples who pray. are here to stay. No, it's better than that. But like, you know, there's nothing more powerful than, you know, a, a husband and wife, which is one body when you're married. You're one body in Christ um, praying together. Like, there's nothing. Every morning, pray together. Every night pray together. I mean, it's just the most powerful thing. The amount of peace, joy, and protection it brings over your home and your minds and your hearts and your children. You know, there's nothing to fear. Nothing in this world can ever cause us fear. Like the Lord tells us over and over again in His Word, do not fear. Why? Because He is our Father is the creator of heaven and earth. What do we have to be afraid of? We have been given the gift of salvation. We are a part of the body of Christ. We are protected. You know? It's just amazing. And all this fear mongering these last couple years, it just drives me insane. Especially when Christians fall into it. I'm like, do you trust him or not? Because I trust him. And his word says... Don't fear, so I'm not going to fear anything. And I'm going to trust that Jesus is going to take care of me through and through. I don't care what it is. Jesus has got me. I thought the scripture said um, that when you're married, you become one body in Christ. You and your husband are one body. Just like, you know, um, Eve was formed from Adam. Husband and wife are one body. There's a scripture. I can't remember the name of the scripture. But yeah, I heard a TikTok the other day talking about the faith of a mustard seed and how we can move mountains with the faith of a mustard seed and you know, how small a mustard seed is, and it's so true, though, you know, like, if you're praying with no faith and no trust, nothing's going to happen. You have to have perfect trust and perfect faith. 
and we are imperfect so we have to ask the Lord to give us that perfect trust and that perfect faith and he will oh it's my husband Yeah, I'll have to look. I'm sure there. I'm sure it is. I'll have to look. I'll have to look it up. You know, because I can't remember every scripture for sure. The most important thing I've learned now is trust. Perfect trust. In Christ alone. Because in the beginning, when I was being delivered, I was afraid of all these things, and He gave me that amazing vision. And um, I don't know, you guys should probably listen to it on YouTube so I don't have to go through the whole thing. Um, but trust. We have to trust him. Like, if we doubt our salvation, that means we don't trust him. Which means, are we going to make it into heaven? Like, think about it. We can't doubt our salvation because it's a gift. It was promised and the Lord doesn't lie. So he promised us if we had faith and trust in him and only him, not in ourselves, but of him, that we shall be saved. So we can't doubt that gift or doubt our salvation because it was promised to us by him in his word. So it's really important that you never, you know, think, you know, well, I'm not good enough. No, it doesn't matter. Of course you're not good enough. That's why Jesus died for you. Thanks for the, um, Beautiful face there. I'm sorry. This is a boring lie. We're talking about Jesus. I mean, we should always strive to do better, yes. But that doesn't mean that, you know, we start doubting what God has promised us. You know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. We're not perfect, so there's no way that we can have perfect trust. But we can say, Lord, I trust you with all of my strength, all of my heart. I love you with all of my heart and all of my strength. And I want to have perfect trust and perfect faith in you. Can you please do what I can't, you know, like help me? And he does. So that way, when those thoughts come, you can very quickly say no. Absolutely not. You know, the word of God says that um, I have the gift of salvation because 
I choose to believe in my Lord and Savior. And he will never leave nor forsake me. Exactly. Because that's who gives us our faith. There's no way we could have it without him. You know, like, that's a whole part of the, you know, receiving new life. Eyes that can see, ears that can hear. Because before any of that, there is no faith. Like, when God decides to, you know, give you a new heart, new mind, and, you know, the Holy Spirit, then you're able to have faith. You know what I mean? after you've repented and turned to him and then he gives you all these because you know and it's just crazy to think you know how incredible God is and how little my people perish for lack of knowledge we can try and try and try to figure it all out but we'll, We'll never get even, get even close, and he knows that. He's given us just what we need, everything we need, you know, to make it out of here um, and be with him. And he's such a good, humble, gracious God that he does it in a way that even a child could understand Yet, a hard-headed adult will deny him. It's just... God's incredible. Anyway, I should probably go to bed because I have to be up at... All my kids go to private school. I homeschooled for a while after the CVID happened. I pulled all my kids out of public school and homeschooled. And then I got pregnant and really sick. Oh my gosh, that was the hardest pregnancy. I was so swollen, I couldn't walk. I was so sick, but I managed to do four kids in private or in homeschooled, four different grades. We managed. And then the baby was due, like, right around the time school started. And I was like, there's no way. So my mother-in-law was like, we should put him in private school, with like a private Christian school. And I was like, you're right, we can't afford that. Here we are. We've got four kids in this private Christian school, which is incredible. Um, but, man, inflation... And, uh, it's been rough. But I think it's a miracle. It's a miracle. We, me and my husband got saved. We moved into our new home. Or we got, got saved, got married. Moved into our new home. Homeschooled for a year. And now all of our kids are in a private Christian school. It's just. You know, and he always finds a way to make it work. Always. Anyway, it was really nice talking to these guys tonight. I would really like to start a prayer group. Because, um, it's the Lord called me to do in the very beginning. To have a prayer group at my home. Um, and if I can't pull that off because I've got all these boys and they always have basketball practice. And, um, karate and... It's just, well, first it was soccer, and now it's basketball. First it was soccer and karate, and now it's basketball and karate. It's every single day of the week they have after-school stuff. It's non-stop. I don't know. I have no time. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I could do, like, an online prayer thing. I don't know. Bible study slash prayer. Or just talking to other brothers and sisters in Christ would be great, you know. Thank you, Skies, for hanging out with me. And if you could, pray for my dad. He's been going through a lot. 
We don't know how much time he has left. His name is Paul. Please pray for him. Pray for his salvation. Because, you know, that's all that matters. And, uh, I know he's not there yet, so he needs to get there before it's too late. So yeah, please keep my father, my dad, in your prayers. His name is Paul. He's got cancer throughout his entire body, and uh, he's miserable, and he needs the comfort, the peace, the rest, and the joy that comes from the Lord. But he doesn't have to be afraid of dying, you know? So you can rejoice and not be afraid. Anyway, thanks, thank you guys so much. I will definitely do this again. I was a little bit nervous because of this new account. I used to go on the other account and it was these all, all these amazing people that would come on and like have these incredible conversations with me um, a lot more people but like you know I knew what to expect it's not many people in here which is fine um, but you know it's hard <laughs> because sometimes you get on and you start talking about the Lord you're gonna get attacked happens to me all the time so anybody have anything they want to say before I get off so my main account is that beauty is my vice it's where like that, that used to be my beauty brand so like that's the name is my brand but I quit doing Instagram, but it's my brand name, but I can't go live over there, but my I post over there, I don't post over here, I just go live over here, but my following's over there, you know, it's just, it stinks, alright guys, well have a wonderful night, and thank you for hanging out with me, <laughs> when you have all these kids, and you're just with kids 24-7, like, it's nice to get to talk to, you know, some adults. <laughs> it is. Even if it's on the internet and I can't see your faces. It's nice to have an adult conversation. So I appreciate it. Seriously, you have no idea. <laughs> Alright, have a good night. God bless all of you. And I never know how to end these things. So yeah, follow Beauty is My Vice, and then I'll normally say like, hey, I'm going to go live on Beauty is My Vice Live, or follow here too, and I'll pop up live sometimes, yeah. I'm going to try to start doing it a couple times a week. It's my goal. Because I haven't been doing near what I should be doing for the Lord. It's just not okay. Alright. Love you guys. Have a wonderful night.